Some people are all about the pristine preservation of our historical accomplishments. We've all seen the 1950s Corvette restored to showroom perfect, so why would I do such a thing to a perfectly good Suburban? We all ponder questions such as, why do pigs fly? And did that stripper really like me? Some questions don't have answers. This all started one day when my wife found a picture on the internet. Before thinking through the ridiculous project I was agreeing to, she called me over and said, honey, do you think we can make this? Sure, I said, before thinking through the ridiculous project I was agreeing to. After all, how hard could it be? Obviously, someone was able to draw it. Drawings always translate perfectly into real life. Now, to figure out which vehicle is the right shape. Possibly a uh, Vespa? No, think bigger. Obviously, I would have to expand substantially beyond the body of the vehicle and figure out how to hide the body as well. So I thought a Suburban would be just perfect. Unfortunately, by the time my rational mind had kicked in, I had already purchased a Suburban and was committed to seeing it through. After a short panic attack and coming to grips with the task I had committed to, I decided to be rational and make a 3D model in SolidWorks. I figured that would at least be a step better than the drawing. If nothing else, at least it made me look like I had a plan. Perfect! This thing is 12 feet wide, 30 feet long, and almost 20 feet tall. 400 pounds of propane neatly fits in the front to power the flame effects. The top gun will shoot a 30 foot explosive fireball, rear exhaust stacks will shoot fire jets, and the front towers will be perfect to chain people to. Somehow this all made sense to me. In my initial sketch, I can't believe I forgot the grappling claw. This is highly important if you want to have any chance of suspending aerial fire performers. As I slowly came down from my Mad Max fantasy world, I realized I had to find a way to make this actually work. Making the tracks a stationary prop was just not an option. Luckily, the Suburban had four-wheel drive. Because the vehicle only had to run at most 10 miles per hour, I would drive the vehicle with the rear axle and use the front axle to drive the tracks. It turns out that I only need 32 inches of lift, and I thought this was going to be hard. Yes, I figured out pretty quickly that I would actually have to use the truck axles to support the vehicle. So, fast forward a bit. I must have forgotten to take a few photos, but I think you get the general concept. The rear end needed to move down 32 inches and back about two feet. I determined the easiest way was to just drop the suspension and build a frame to support the new position. The drive shaft was gonna end up at a pretty steep angle, but it wasn't going to bind and we were only going 10 miles per hour. What could possibly go wrong? Look mom, no mounting brackets. This should be pretty easy. I just need to make the bottom thingy be reattached to the top thingy, but in a different place than where the thingy was before. A little plasma cutting and air hammer and those rivets fell right out. Now for some magic. Yes, I know it's not magic, but let me have my moment. A slight adjustment was needed to the original leaf spring mounting blocks. Yes, I'm aware it's a very steep angle, but just bear with me. This is gonna be really cool, so it'll make up for it. Oh yes, where were we? Time to remove the drive shaft and reposition this where it belongs. A lift kit by any other name as well, let's just say it fixed a problem. It's an amazing what you can do with a little three inch box tubing. Back in place and you can barely tell it's not factory. Now where'd that drive shaft go? Just a little finish welding and we have a winner. Turns out I also made a great place to put a platform for the generator. So back to this turny thing, it's way too short. While I considered using my Acme tubing stretcher, I decided to take a fancier approach. Ah, much better. Turns out that the drive shaft was just made from three inch tubing. In this modern world we live in, we can even have it delivered. Now to attach the round thing to the other round thing, I considered using some hot glue, but I ultimately decided to be professional and use some of that melty metal stuff instead. It worked like a charm. Moving to the front axle, I was greeted with some additional challenges. Turns out that unlike the rear axle, this axle has to do some additional wizardry if you want to do more than just go in a straight line. After great contemplation, I decided that dropping the suspension 32 inches was going to create a situation that I can't easily remedy with what I learned in high school geometry class. Perfect! That came off easy enough. On top of that, it was right where it needed to be. However, 32 inches lower and a few popsicle sticks away from being ready to go. I know what you're thinking. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen. Oh, you're actually wondering how that steering arm thingy is going to attach to the axle that is now lying on the ground. Fear not mere mortals. When there's a will, there's someone crazy enough to try. First, however, we need to attach the axle back to the springs. In case you're wondering, I was joking about the popsicle sticks. I don't have that kind of budget. So go back to the three inch box tube with a little weld here and a little weld there. We now have something that will make off-roaders shudder in fear. Look at those mighty springs holding up the castle. Come on, you didn't actually think I wasn't gonna put a torsion bar on there. Oh, wait, 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 don't answer that. Just go take a deep breath, bear with me. I'm going somewhere with this. 
First, before I forget, there's a slight matter of brake line extensions. Now, before you all get up in my shit and remind me the brakes just make you slow down, my wife insisted. And sometimes you just have to remember, happy wife, happy life. Okay, uncover your eyes. It's not quite as scary as it looks. Well, well, yeah, actually it is, but it's only weird till it works. There was a little trial and error, but after I added a hydraulic boost cylinder, we were good to go. On the bottom, I had to create a little modern art sculpture to tie the shaft to the steering knuckles because I did not trust welding directly to the knuckles. Do you ever weld your knuckles? It's not fun. I knew I held onto those extra sockets for a reason. There was a lot of finish welding, a little bit of crying, a fair amount of kicking, but the screaming was kept to a minimum. Just give me the benefit of the doubt that all the little stuff I didn't show somehow magically got completed. As much as the interior of a 1988 Suburban is the epitome of design perfection, did not quite live up to the diesel punk aesthetic I was going for. When all else fails, cover it in bed liner. The fire missiles button is fully installed. They're just for show. Or are they? Where the back seat previously resided, the place where normal people put their kids, we now have an access route to get to the gunner position on the roof. Not quite as lounge worthy as before, but the foam rubber floor does add some squishy luxury. With those pesky wheel wells removed, the future's wide open. Sheet aluminum is nicely filmed in that 1950s futuristic feel. I have the headliner removed and some holes cut in the roof. It's like T-tops for rednecks, but without the tops, but with the rednecks. Well, I guess all T-tops are for rednecks. Where was I going with this? I filled in the roof with some of that fancy metal forming stuff. I think I saw it on TV once. It was that show with all the yelling. This was a pain in the ass, but it seems to be coming together pretty good. Ah, roof, there it is. When the roof catches on fire, I will totally regret cutting apart that fire extinguisher. Ah, it's starting to take shape. Um, some sort of shape. Those pesky corners that just have to be unique. No one ever said I want to be a problem child when I grow up. But corners will be corners. Well, damn! Looks like I almost have a plan here. <laughs> like it's supposed to go there. And I thought I was going to have to fix this in post. Shiny and chrome. Here we come. Everything that glitters isn't gold. Especially the rust trim that I riveted to finish out the design. A little old school wire loom and the theme is coming together nicely. Come on, I've been doing all the work so far. Your turn, say something. Ah, we're getting somewhere. There's a long way to go. The whole interior needs lights, cushions, stripper poles, alcohol, and lots of people without enough common sense to stay away. I contacted General Motors about making this a factory option. I'm sure I'll hear back any day now. Advanced navigation system installed. I'm not a complete barbarian. I did keep the gauges. Yes, it does have nuclear strike capabilities. As much as the whole lounge feel is appealing, I decided to add seats to aid into the driving task. However, I still don't have an answer for the questionable linkage between the seat and the gas pedal. The seats were salvaged out of an old 6x6 amphibious vehicle. They were in rough shape and had to be completely rebuilt. Now we're moving on to upholstery 101. Lesson 1. Duct tape is your friend. I added a piece of wood. For some reason, this was important. It's pattern time. Now taking appointments for prom dress fitting. I sew, therefore I am. Next, Zen and the Art of Staple Gun. Ever try to shove a golf ball through a garden hose? That is kind of what this was like trying to stretch this vinyl over the back seat. This is where the heat gun technician skills really kicked in. That whole back cushion thing we talked about? All flame throwing vehicles have to have their softer side. After a ritual tree sacrifice, we have the perfect foundation for the rear cushions. I just happen to have extra foam from a previous project. I love being able to put a positive spin on overpurchasing. It's kind of like furniture for dummies. Back to the whole stapling thing we talked about before. Mike, Steve, I'm really sorry we couldn't work out our differences, but you'll always be part of this project in a special way. So if you're still following along from before, the rear axle had to move back a couple feet. So here I'm extending the frame to enlarge the body. Yes, I'm jumping around a bit, so if you're missing the professional suspension fabrication, just rewind a bit. If you have ADD, everything looks amazing! So, I found these weird 8 foot wide bumper things at an auction. Free pony to anyone who can figure out where they came from. Another one of these bumper things for the front end. It's all tied to the roof platform for a second story build. This platform extends all the way to the back. Side platforms and rail in place. Strategically placed to keep infantry, I mean drunk people, from falling off. 
Time to do some exterior cladding. Math is hard. Did you know that if you buy rivets in 20 pound boxes, they're cheaper? Operation Hide the Suburban coming along nicely. While I welded the rear doors shut, I made the front doors still operational, so we didn't have to go all Dukes of Hazard and shit. Old motocross tires provided the trim for much of the vehicle. The word of the day is free. After some failed beginnings, borrowing and stealing, I found some cheap motorcycle flarings on Craigslist. This will add some shape to the all flat sheet metal surfaces. After sanding them down, a nice coat of urethane bed liner made them oh so pretty. So before you tell me how I ruined a bunch of perfectly good motorcycle parts, there is a plan here, maybe. Someone threw out some perfectly good stock Harley exhaust pipes. They're perfect for making artillery shells. Just add one pound of black powder, I, I mean cap off the ends, you get the idea. This episode was brought to you today by the shape circle and the number 3.14. The entire concept of building tracks seemed a bit daunting, so building 12 sets really put me at ease. All good stories start with that one time I was cutting up a bunch of metal. Ah, damn it, I cut it twice and it's still too short. Here's a frame I made of some type. I think it's supposed to hold wheels or something. Ah, there we go. This should help. Mommy, where do your babies come from? These look just like the print. Oh, gee, that can't be right. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Oh, st stick with me here. I think I'm onto something. Okay, almost done. Now I just need to figure out how to make this float in place. It has to freely move up and down and pivot when it encounters terrain. After giving up on the idea of having a bunch of people hold it there and call it performance art, it looks like somehow I'm going to have to mount it to the axle. While I mentioned at the beginning that the front drive shaft was going to power the tracks, this was not actually the original concept. The idea was that the bottom tracks were going to ride on the ground and then power the rest of the tracks. This became extremely complicated when I had to deal with such things as steering suspension and geometry. We'll get more on this later, but let's first figure out that axle thing. On a bright note, I found something I can use to cry myself to sleep at night. Steel, the other heavy metal. I just need to space these out past the wheel hubs and mount the tracks on some flange bearings. It'll practically build itself. Ah, steel disc holes with countersinks. This is just what the doctor ordered. Without my welder, I am nothing. I should probably see someone about this. Add a few custom made lug nut spacers and we're good to go. Now let's hop in the Wayback Machine and see how this was actually made. First, we have the pillow block mounting plate. I found out if you get fancy and tap the holes, the bolts actually go in easier. Now to attach the tracks. You didn't think we were gonna get off easy, did you? So machine and rounded over float bars to allow the track height to vary with the terrain. Now for a picture of the steel float pin slot slide thingy. Ah, there we go, that's my good side. Here's where shit got real. The first problem, the bottom of the slide pivots. This allows the track frame to hit the wheel. Second, the entire track mechanism is a lot of weight to put on the axle, and when I try to load on the trailer, it pivots and hits the body of the truck. Seems a little sloppy to me. Would you let your wheels go out dressed like that? Ah, perfectly fixed. Let me know if you have any idea what this means. Let's take a break from the previous headache and figure out how to build the rest of the tracks. Kids, don't try this at home. Go to your friend's house with better tools and less supervision. Sprockets and bearings, oh my. You get a discount when you call the supplier and tell them you need like a hundred of these. So the tracks are made out of surplus conveyor belt. It's lightweight and best of all, I already had it. The bandsaw made quick work out of this one. Now to drill 1.3 million holes to attach the treads. Next we'll use alligator lacing grip to attach the two ends of the belt together. These would probably make a great torture device too. Hammer it in place and ready to rock and roll. When you can't finesse it in place, don't force it. Use a bigger hammer. Now for the question of the day, what well, requires two sheets of marine grade plywood and a lot of patience? Time to make the tank treads. Here's the blocks for the inside of the tracks to guide them on the wheels. T-Rex bed liner. I always know I'm in good hands when the label on the bottle has a picture of a vicious predator chomping down on the helpless. As I gave all the treads a new coat, I remembered bed liner is the new black. On to the next step, drill holes, insert bolts, rinse, repeat, never stop. You can't have a good story without tragedy. So after sorting out the whole fiasco, the bottom track frame was welded rigid and the angled tracks were separated from the lower tracks. The lower tracks ride in the ground, which causes them to roll. 
The upper tracks will be tied to the drive shaft mechanism and run off the sprocket tied to the front axle mount on the transfer case. Let's just say it's a work in progress. In the final rendition, the tires will be completely hidden from view. The Harbor Freight Special tires were not quite doing it for me. Here's a little Photoshop for your viewing pleasure so you can see how we're going to fix this. Time to fire up the plasma table I built and cut out the aluminum shiny parts. I swear, the computer made me do it. These things are going to take over the world, but I'm ready. Where's my tinfoil hat? Now for the top steel parts. This half is less shiny and chrome. Now for a little rust, just add some vinegar and salt water. For full transparency, I'm not sponsored by Kroger. However, Kroger, if you're listening, I'm willing to sell my soul. Oh, the tragedy of it all. Actually, the rust is kind of pretty. So this vehicle requires a ton of fake shocks for all the tracks. So how do I make these things with no budget? It turns out that surplus oil filters for vehicles that no longer exist are pretty cheap. If you never cut apart like 50 oil filters on a lathe, have you even lived? All painted up and ready for prom night. Don't tell them they're not real or feed them after midnight. So to get this vehicle approved for Burning Man, I had to submit a lighting plan. I probably should have given myself more than two days to build all of this. So anyhow, let's give it the old college try. Turns out some old hubcaps make perfect housings for the lights. And people give me a hard time about being a hoarder. Some waterproof RGB sign light modules were perfect for the project. A little black paint and a screwed on mounting plate, we have a winner. You know all those speaker grills that you never ended up using? Turns out with a little spray paint, they're quite interesting looking. They make perfect covers for the lights along with some translucent acrylic I cut on my CNC router. Okay, enough with the hoarder thing, I have feelings. Adding some expanded metal to the lights adds to the whole, you know, I just stole this from a junkyard feeling. All trimmed out and ready for a night on town. The interior is a whole other lighting project in and of itself. I'm using the same concept here, mounted onto a flat plate to save space. The clear dome is glued on top of the lights. Ah, back to those speaker grills again. See, just add 12 volts and we're starting to get our dignity back. So now we're on to the propane flame effects. This is the part where I had to look like I knew what I was doing. It's like fake it till you make it on steroids. So here's the plumbing layout I submitted. It all seemed completely reasonable on paper. So I have a confession to make. I only had time to finish the one main cannon. Additionally, I haven't even started my 10 step pyro program yet. The main barrel is a 12 foot long, four inch diameter piece of aluminum tubing. And on a side note, I identify as sane. The cannon is triggered by a two inch ASCO propane valve rated to 25 PSI. Go big or go home. The propane tank screws directly to a cast iron flange that exits into a two inch steel pipe. Here we have the welded aluminum assembly with the flanges attached. Expansion tank, valve, and cannon barrel in place, ready for test fire. Here we have the pilot light and plumbing in place. This part of the project was getting completed as we were packing up for Burning Man. This is not exactly the most precise fabrication I've ever done. Actually, it was more of an, oh shit, what am I doing, triage type of thing. Anyhow, you can see the rudimentary cannon base with some of the test fit motorcycle flarings. Oh well, we'll figure it out when we get there. Load it up and ready to go. I actually had to build the trailer just to fit the vehicle. My old trailer was too small. Talk about making a mountain out of a molehill. No, I'm not dragging ass. I'm trying to pop a wheelie. Ah, uh, now we're at the gate trying to get into Burning Man. They have to make sure we're not smuggling hippies. Now we're in line at the Department of Mutant Vehicles. They have to make sure I mutated it enough to get approved. Spoiler alert, we passed. So look, we're dorks. So far, so good. I also made some pyro for the trailer that doubles as a stage. The views weren't bad. Where do we go from here? I'm not gonna pretend that this project is all that plus a bag of chips. Maybe a half-filled bag of Cheetos while we're trying to stand there looking cool with orange hands. This project is only about half done, but I do plan to finish it one day. So far, it has been a huge undertaking and it's gonna take a lot more time before it's completed. On a bright note, this misguided adventure is to be continued.